Hallelujah and blessings, friends. Welcome back to Haya Kadosh Ministries, where holiness is a way of life. And Jesus, the promised one, he is King of Kings and Lord of Lords. And together, God's people say, Hallelujah. Well, friends, we are continuing our study in the book of Galatians. And as we move into chapter 3, and we touched on it a little bit in our last time together, we're going to pick up today in verse 10, and we're going to attempt to work our way through the end of the chapter. Now, I don't want to portray in any way that I have a complete grasp on what Paul is telling us here, because it's almost impossible to understand the fullness of what Paul is teaching unless we come from the mindset that has been deeply ingrained with the Jewish law. Even Peter, a Jew himself, who walked and had the privilege of being under the teaching of the Lord Jesus, found it very difficult to understand what it was Paul was saying. In his second book in chapter 3, beginning at verse 14, Peter says, Wherefore, beloved... Seeing that you look for such things, be diligent that you may be found of Jesus in peace, without spot and blameless, and account that the long suffering of Jesus is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul also, according to the wisdom given unto him, has written unto you. But now notice this in verse 16, as also in all his epistles, in all of his letters to the Galatians, to the Ephesians, to the Colossians, to the Romans, to the Corinthians, in all of his letters, speaking in them of these things that I, Peter, am telling you, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable wrestle with, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction." So if you feel a little bit confused by what it is that we're discussing, if you feel like you don't completely have a grip on it, you are in good company, friends, because even Peter himself and most likely the rest of the disciples and very well-educated men from the time of the disciples and Paul's ministry up until the very day that we live in have found these things that Paul teaches very difficult to understand. And I say this because I don't want you to feel apprehensive in our times together as we're trying to wrestle with these things. But just take a breath, relax, and look for the simplicity in the message. Because the reason that these things can be so complex is we're approaching them from an intellectual standpoint. But obviously, we want to approach them from a spiritual standpoint, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to our souls and teach us these truths that the Lord Jesus would have us to know. And so with that being said, we're going to begin at verse 10, and we'll talk about these passages as we work our way to the end of the chapter. He says in verse 10, For as many are as of the works of the law are under the curse. Now, you have to understand the blessing of keeping the law is given to us in Deuteronomy chapter 28. And in that same chapter are also given the curses of not keeping the law. And I would highly recommend that you read that chapter. But what Paul has stated here is that as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse of the law. For it is written, cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Notice that word all there, because that comprises every single law that God gave to Moses. And friends, there are over 700 of them. And so just stop and imagine for a moment, if every day when you wake up, you felt the burden of having not to break one of those 700 laws which means you would have to be very aware of what those laws are and you would have to live every detail of your life in fear that you are on the brink of actually breaking one of those laws. And so you can imagine why Paul uses that word curse here because that is a curse to wake up each day in such fear. 
to live your life with such apprehension. He goes on in verse 11 and he says, but that no man is justified before God by the law, for it is evident the just shall live by faith. So when he says it is evident, what he's saying here is that this is nothing new. This is the same message that we have that dates all the way back to Abraham, long before the law was given even to Moses. Because we can look at the life of Abraham and we see that Abraham lived his life by faith, not under the law because no law had been given yet. But do we see Abraham doing things that brought God displeasure? Of course not. Because Abraham was a friend of God, he knew God, and he loved God, he lived his life to be pleasing to God. And because he knew God, he understood the character and the nature of God. And so he knew that he was to conform his life to that nature and character, not to follow his own natural way, his own natural character. And so Paul says this is evidence. He says, the law is not of faith. If you wake up every day under the burden of the law, there's no faith involved in that. But if you wake up each morning and your outlook on the day is simply one of another opportunity to serve your God in the many ways presented to you throughout the day, that, friends, is faith. The law is not of faith, but the man that does the law shall live in the law. But Christ, the promised one, Jesus has redeemed us from the curse of the law. He was made a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. And so as we come to God in repentance, we are confessing the shame, the guilt, the lack of obedience that we have lived up until this point. We're not coming to God with the merits that we deserve his salvation, but we bow our heads in shame and guilt because we don't deserve salvation, but we see the free gift offered before us and we reach out and we receive that gift. We receive that forgiveness. We receive that redemption. He is purchasing us back. And what is he purchasing us from? A life of sin, of shame, and of guilt, of disobedience. And so now Paul is going to try to explain what it is that he has just said. In verse 15, he says, Brethren, I speak after the manner of men. These aren't spiritual things I'm telling you. These are common sense understandings that every man should be able to get his head around. Though it be but a man's covenant, if it be confirmed, no man can disannul it. It is a legal binding contract, and no man can add to it. Now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. He did not say into seeds as of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is the promised one, the Messiah, Jesus the Christ. And this I say, that the covenant that was confirmed before of God in Christ, the law, which was 430 years after the life of Abraham, it cannot disannul that it should make the promise of none effect. So the law doesn't do away with the promise. The law was added for a very specific reason, and we're about to discover what that is. But the promise goes before the law. And what is the promise? That if we will exercise faith in God, which means a total and absolute surrender of our will, and we give ourselves unto his will, we will be blessed and highly favored with God, just as Abraham himself was. He continues in verse 18, For if the inheritance which was promised to Abraham and his seed, that being Christ, be of the law, then it's no more a promise. Because in the law, you earn what you have been given. But the promise isn't based upon your effort. 
The promise is based upon your surrender. And surrender is the absolute opposite of effort. Hallelujah. So if the inheritance be of the law, it is no more of promise, but God gave it to Abraham by promise. There's nothing that you have to do, Abraham. Simply believe. There's nothing that you have to do, friend. Simply believe. Surrender your will and pursue his will. So now Paul, understanding the questions that are going on in those wheels that are turning in the minds of the readers and knowing that they are probably thinking, then what is the purpose of the law? If it's all about grace, if it's all about faith, why do we need the law? And that's how he begins verse 19. He says, wherefore then serves the law? It was added because of your transgression. God gave man the law because man has a tendency to do what is opposed to God's law. So God has to set perimeters. It would be like owning an automobile in a place where there are no street signs, there are no speed limits. Someone is bound to get behind the wheel of that automobile and drive recklessly. So all of those who live amongst this driver would have to come together and say, look, we have to set some type of law because without the law, he's going to continue to endanger the lives of all those around him. And that's what Yahweh is saying. He's saying, if I leave you to your own, you're going to destroy yourselves. So I have to set limits and boundaries around you so that you know where to stop and what not to exceed. He says, the law was added because of transgressions till the seed should come to whom the promise was made. And whom was the promise made? Jesus, the promised one. And it was ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, a mediator is not a mediator of one, but God is one. Is the law then against the promises of God? God forbid, for if there had been a law given which could have given life, Verily, righteousness should have been by the law. In other words, there is no life in living under the rule of thumb. If you wake up each day and every aspect of your life is dictated to you, you have no choices whatsoever. That, my friend, is imprisonment. That's what the law is. It imprisons you. But liberty is giving you the opportunity to make your own choices, and we are speaking spiritually here, and those choices would bring pleasure to God. And so Christ has come to give us liberty to live our lives so that our lives bring him honor, glory, and praise. He doesn't want to micromanage our lives. He wants us to micromanage our lives. Hallelujah. Verse 22, he says, but the scripture has concluded all under sin. Why? Because all have broken the law. All have transgressed the laws of God. We did it before we were even able to speak. We were born with the nature of rebellion and disobedience. And the only one ever born by woman who did not carry that nature was the Lord Jesus himself. And so he says that the promise by faith of Jesus Christ might be given to them that believe. But before faith came, we were kept under the law, shut up unto the faith which should afterwards be revealed. In other words, before Jesus came, we lived under the law. He's speaking specifically of the Jewish people here, but even of those Gentile people who observed the laws of Yahweh and forwent their own pagan gods, systems, and religions. And so because of this, in verse 24, the law was our schoolmaster. It taught us where we were in error. It taught us how far from God we had fallen in revealing to us where God had drawn the boundary lines and we had crossed them so often. And so again, we come to Christ not based upon all the good things that we've done, but we come to Jesus Christ based upon all the bad things that we've done, realizing that we desperately need his forgiveness. And once we receive that forgiveness, after that faith has come, we are no longer under a schoolmaster. We are no longer under the law. For we are the children of God now because of faith in Christ Jesus. Not because of what we've done, but because of what he has done for us. 
For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. This isn't speaking of water baptism. This is saying that you have been submerged. You have been drowned. You have been consumed in the person of Jesus Christ. And now because you are in him, when God looks upon you, he first sees Jesus. He doesn't see your shame. He doesn't see your guilt. He only sees the blood that has been sprinkled upon your life and that has washed you whiter than snow, friends. What glory and honor and praise he so deserves. And because of this, there is neither Jew nor Greek. There's neither bond nor free. There's neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you be Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed. And because you now are a part of Abraham's seed, the Lord Jesus himself, you are heirs according to all the promise that the Father has bestowed upon the seed, Jesus himself, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. You are a benefactor to the inheritance that has been promised to him because you are in him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Well, friends, if you've ever had problems with Galatians chapter three, or for that matter, even the first three or four chapters in the book of Romans, hopefully this has helped to clarify some of those issues. And again, don't try to get your intellectual mind around it because that's only going to complicate the issues. Just live under the simplicity of knowing Jesus and bringing him pleasure in all you do. And if that truly is your utmost goal, you will never miss the mark because your motives and your priorities are in the proper place. As Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, seek ye first the kingdom of God and all these other things will be added unto you. All these other things will take care of themselves. Your mission in life is to seek him first in all things. Amen. Well, friends, I love you. We're going to end there today. Next time we'll pick up in Galatians chapter four. I truly pray that your journey with the Lord Jesus is being blessed and fruitful and that in all things you are seeking to bring him honor, praise, and glory. Now, as he wills, and until next time, friends, I love you and I'll see you on the next video.